بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین السلاۃ والسلام علی رسول الکریم ویلکم ٹو آئی بی ایس سینٹر فار ایکسلنس ان اسلامک فائنینس آئی لائک ٹو ویلکم آل دا پارٹیسپینٹس دا پینلسٹ السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ اینڈ تھینک یو فار جوائننگ اس ٹوڈے ود دا سیمینار آن آن اسلامک فن ٹیک بلاک چین ٹیکنالوجی اینڈ اٹس رول ان فائنینشیل انکلوژن وی آر ویری ہیپی اینڈ پلیز ٹو آرگنائز دس سیمینار اینڈ وی ہیو ٹو ٹو ویری سینئر ایکسپرٹس آن اسلامک فائنینس اینڈ وی ہیو مسٹر بلال رسول صاحب ہو از ایگزیکٹو ڈائریکٹر and uh, he is heading the islamic finance department at secp and we have mr ashar nazim who is the chief operating uh, a chief executive officer of eon digital bahrain uh, both uh, participants both speakers of uh, which we have joined who have joined us today they have uh, they carry a vast experience of islamic finance then they have the role in the policy making they have played a critical role in promotion of islamic finance so i like to thank uh, bilal rasul sahab uh, and ashar nazim sahab for joining us today uh, this webinar uh, is organized by ibsc in collaboration with securities and exchange commission of pakistan and uh, it's it's on a very important topic of how we can use technology how we can use the modern trends to enhance the financial inclusion in Uh, uh, for islamic finance especially in the in the context of pakistan and also in a broader context at the global level how we can uh, take the reach of islamic finance to a new uh, new heights how we can uh, reduce the the challenges uh, that islamic finance face the, the the customers face the challenges where they they are not able to reach the services offered by islamic financial institution so our focus today is let's uh, share and listen from the experts how islamic finance can be beneficial how we can increase the reach of islamic finance how we can include a greater population muslim population as well as uh, those who are interested in ethical finance through the use of financial technology through the use of blockchain and the emerging trends so uh, uh, i'll start the the seminar with the recitation of holy quran اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله احد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا احد صدق الله العظيم so once again i like to welcome all the participants uh, i like to uh, also mention that this webinar is also uh, broadcasted live on the facebook you can see on the ibsc uh, facebook page as well as uh, all uh, all the participants who have joined us today on zoom so you can ask the question from the panelists you can use the chat box option to to write your questions and we will try to answer some of the question during the talk and we will take some of the questions uh, uh, towards our panelists and they will be inshallah they will be answering those question so without further delay i like to invite our first speaker for his welcome note and his, uh, his thoughts about uh, fintech financial inclusion and the role uh, the, that secp as a policy maker is doing so i like to invite mr bilal rasul sahab who is the secretary to the commission and policy board executive director of secp and head of islamic finance a seasoned uh, expert a regulator a supporter of islamic finance so bilal rasul sahab uh thank you for joining us and i'd like to invite you to uh, to say to your opening remarks jazakallah thank you ahmed auz billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim assalatu wassalamu alayka ya rasulullah sadaqallahu alazi uh assalamu alaikum to everyone uh thank you uh for joining us um i'm sorry if you just So excuse me for that uh this uh, the position I'm at I have to receive phone calls um yeah so this is our second webinar in collaboration with IBA and uh 
Uh, incidentally, the first seminar was also on financial inclusion and fintech. And um, uh, I'm not going to say too much. I'd rather hear from Usher. It's an honor to have Usher with us. Uh, though I have not uh, been in touch with him to my dismay and uh, my regrets. Uh, but since he's here today, I will uh, like him to take up uh, the majority of the time. Uh, Asher, we um, had an initial webinar uh, pretty much on the same lines uh, or, um, as what we are uh, speaking today. I think we had additionally, Sukuk was another theme in uh, the last uh, webinar. But I, I'm just going to very, very briefly without um, boring the participants who might be here for the second time um, uh, who were there in the first webinar as well. I'm just going to touch upon what I, I'm just going to give you my thoughts on what I think about Islamic FinTech and uh, financial inclusion. Um, what I said in, in, in the last webinar was that, uh, uh, you know, the, the punchline was that uh, disruption by by financial uh, technology and especially in Islamic financial technology uh, is going to be sooner than we think. And uh, there are uh, very exciting times uh, right now. Um, uh, in fact, uh, it's so quick that uh, uh, RegTech will be having problems because the products and the solutions out there are coming in very rapidly. Uh, in terms of the regulatory environment uh, at SECP, we just have a sort of what we call a regulatory sandbox in which, uh, you know, there's all kinds of crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending and other types of uh, startups that are just, uh, you know, sort of uh, messing around in the sandbox. Uh, we don't have an environment as such, uh, and uh, I, for as a regulator, I think RegTech is uh, especially important. And like I said last time, uh, you know, uh, we, we we don't want to uh, be too late in uh, the regulation and supervision of this, uh, you know, a completely new era of uh, innovation that's going to come in. Uh, but um, Yes, uh, what we would like to see from the market is, you know, all kinds of solutions in which, uh, uh, especially the uh, the uh, unbanked and the uh, you know the the, the faith driven investors and savers, uh, they they can have solutions, uh, uh, especially low cost funds, you know, and um, through fintech, I think um, a lot of the uh, you know, the, the middleman and the intermediaries that make a lot of commissions and drive up the cost of funds, I think they can be eliminated. And then it's, uh, I personally feel the responsibility of the state to support such a system. It would have to come from the state uh, in which, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I had explained in the last webinar that uh, there are some things, you know, or some uh, products such as mini sukuk, you know, the the peer-to-peer -peer lending which starts at 500 rupees of financing. So uh, we can come up with mini sukuk. You know, there is a green sukuk out there. So I had suggested, uh, you know, a brown sukuk and an orange sukuk for the poor and for the agriculturists but uh, very, uh, very small as compared to the larger corporate uh, sukuks, uh, in which, you know, the uh, small saver and investor can sort of, if it's uh, sovereign backed or if it's so sovereign sponsored, uh, I think it, it, that, that is uh, where uh, we can make inroads into. And, you know, it, it would give Islamic finance the new dimension and the new perspective it really needs in Pakistan. Um, you know, a couple of days ago, I had, uh, uh, I was speaking with one of the universities and uh, I was telling them that, you know, it, it's not really awareness creation in Pakistan, it's con confidence building that is required. And um, maybe, you know, this is an area where, and I, and I think it's an opportune time where the state can come in and give the, uh, give Islamic finance a whole new complexion um, as far as, you know, um, again, uh, kickstarting the Islamic finance uh, initiative, because 
uh we sort of you know and i mean islamic banks have done phenomenally in pakistan but still not at that place and you know the the uh in in terms of milestones i think we're still not there uh it could have been a much much larger market that than we already have right now so a lot of potential there uh islamic fintech is definitely the solution i'm going to hand it over to you asha i we would like to hear your thoughts and then uh you know i always have a press uh, a preference for uh uh interactive sessions and you know if there are any questions i think we we should take on questions and try to make this a little more interactive as well but uh, amen will tell you how much time you have but over to you thank you thank you bilal saab uh, for your introductory remarks and highlighting the critical role for islamic fintech and especially the reg tech or the regulatory uh, involvement in the promotion of these new technologies now uh, without uh, further delay i would like to uh, invite uh, mr asher nazim saab uh, for his expert talk on this subject uh, asher is a uh, you know is a known figure in islamic finance mashallah he has contributed a lot he has served at, uh, in different key positions with central bank of bahrain eny and uh, there's a whole list of his achievement mashallah uh, and uh, over probably 25 years of experience with, uh, with of islamic finance at different capacities and now uh, his latest passion is technology and islamic finance so i think uh, we uh, he is the most suitable person to highlight and guide us on this Uh, so thank you asher once again for joining us today and now the floor is yours jazakumullah assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh nahmadu wa sallallahu ala rasulil karim bismillahir rahmanir rahim thank you very much uh, ahmad uh, always good to see you bilal saab uh, really good to see you again and and thank you for the hospitality last time and and, and again good to be here in this forum uh today as well i think aap logo ne you've set the tone right with a lot of very pertinent points and that is about you know how can we ahmed mentioned how can we increase the reach of islamic finance is the more pertinent question today uh you mentioned about the reg tech and and i believe that that's absolutely fundamental and whether we are in fintech or islamic fintech if we are student of islamic finance it's very important to broaden our horizon and understand what these reg tech and ed tech and health tech and fintech mean uh and and that confidence building will 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 definitely come uh once we start implementing some of these initiatives in a very small manner uh very briefly if i can uh, set the tone of the session today so uh, uh in my last four years of course as ahmed mentioned i've got some experience with ey uh with the central banks uh you know with the public sector and four years back i decided to enter technology space not knowing anything about technology and the reason was uh, like ahmed like bilal saab i'm absolutely convinced that the next phase of proliferation of islamic finance is only going to come if we have the right business model in place so what that means is the first gen or the last 50 60 70 years of islamic finance was more about okay understanding what the governance is going to look like what the product structures are going to look like and that we've achieved uh, to a big extent and kudos to us right i mean so so that's really well done uh, but really the next phase uh, of success is going to be about how do you democratize this finance how do you really spread the reach and how do you tackle some of the fundamental issues which are inherent to the financial services industry uh, how do you address those as a result of uh, uh, of exponential technologies that we are seeing uh so four years back i gave up my partnership at ey to start um, this venture and to share with you in the last four years um, we put together a team of primarily pakistanis i must say uh, who helped build the first independent challenger bank in uae that is going to get launched this year right it's a full fledged retail and commercial bank and the kind of challenge that was given to us is an islamic license they have the kind of challenge given to us was how do we operate with zero operations team how do we operate with one branch right so and and that um, you know bank is up and running right now and will be announced very soon we are also working with the second largest islamic bank in the world kuwait finance house 
which is right now which has chosen us to rewire their entire business around a platform model. Uh, I'm going to share some experience from there. We are working, we are in very advanced conversations with the Saudi National Credit Bureau, who's saying, you know what? The traditional credit bureau models are out. How can I increase financial inclusion by actually leveraging the kind of transaction data and open banking data that is coming my way? Right? We are working with some of the largest retail groups, and this is very interesting in GCC, who are saying, you know what, I've got a footfall of 100 million uh, customers per year, and really I'm leaving a lot of money on the table. How do I get into the financial services space and I want to be double compliant? So there are some very interesting conversation and like previous times, I'd like to have a more practical conversation in terms of what is next for as students of Islamic finance, what is next in terms of acquiring skills? What kind of skills are, are required, right? Uh, this session uh, is going to be more about, um, I'm going to touch on uh, the FinTech and the Islamic FinTech in particular, uh, uh, but it is important for us to understand the why part. Why are we here today? Why does it matter? Uh, you know, you're giving a lot of your very expensive time. Why does it matter? And just so that we are all on the same page, what I will say is uh, FinTech, uh, we define FinTech as customer facing apps, the business models that are built around exponential technologies, right? And, and in simple terms around platforms. And I'll talk about it a bit in, in detail as well. So FinTechs, we are gonna talk about in today's session, especially customer facing uh, business models. Uh, that are wired around exponential technologies, especially platforms, right? And then we are talking, going to talk about a little bit about Islamic fintech, or as I say, you know, there's a difference between Islamic fintech and fintech for Islamic finance. We're going to talk about that. The idea, the objective of this session will be to highlight certain innovative business models which are in play in emerging markets in Middle East and Asia. Uh, we are going to talk about why does it matter? Because, you know, 70%, 80% of skill set that we have today, we've got 70 participants right now, 71, right? Uh, and, and what I will say is, what if I were to tell you that much of the skill set that you've got today is going to be redundant in, in, in a very short time period. And it's very important for us to reinvent ourselves, understand what really matters, right? I mean, for the Islamic uh, finance industry. Uh, what I would like to do is I would like to leave some thinking points. We will not have answers to everything. Blockchain is a huge topic. FinTech itself is a huge topic, right? So we are going to just touch base upon uh, uh, some elements of it. What my effort will be is to leave certain thinking points for the audience that we can perhaps dwell in, uh, dwell on in, uh, in, in further sessions down the road. This is not going to be about a Sharia debate and it's not going to be about a technology session, right? This is going to be about laymen like you and me who want to understand how can Islamic finance become relevant to larger masses. So with that, what I will say is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, so this is the four or five key themes I'm gonna cover. What is the problem statement? When we are talking to our clients, when we are talking to consumers in the market, there are three key problems that are typically highlighted. One is across Middle East, South Asia, uh, you know, there's very low financial inclusion. Uh, and, and in fact, the World Bank says only about 15% of the population across Middle East and South Asia are today banked, right? Uh, we are not talking about underbanked or unhappily banked. We're just talking about the unbanked, so massive, right? So huge potential. So the problem statement number one is there's low financial inclusion and we've been talking about this forever, but really how do we change this? Do we see this getting changed as a result of uh, FinTech business models? Number one. Number two, the fact of the matter is currently the banks, the way they're structured today, they've got a very high cost to acquire and cost to serve. The co their cost of customer acquisition is so high that, you know, I mean, they're not able to do justice in terms of the returns they're able to generate and share with, for example, depositors or investment account holders. Similarly, the amount of uh, cost they incur to serve these customers, especially the middle, uh, you know, the middle class and the lower middle class, is so high that they do not want them to be walking into their branches. So banks by design have, achha, so I'll be talking about a lot of themes here and each one of them, I, try, I tell you, are very powerful themes. And these are themes that we can have, you know, half day sessions on each theme. But I'm just going to talk about a few points. I'm going to stop 
at the end of each segment and take a few questions. And then if there are uh, any major heavy questions, of course, I'll direct them to Ahmed. I'm just kidding. But you know, we'll take it in the end as, as well. Right? Uh, so, but this is the crux of our experience in the industry that the high cost of customer acquisition and the high cost to serve these customers have led the banking industry and the Islamic banking industry, the traditional Islamic banking industry to actually exclude a large part of our population from the financial space, right? And that is a problem here we need to address. And the third one is in Pakistan, especially and in larger Middle East, you are seeing some strong demand for double compliant financial solution. And what that means is, yes, we want Sharia compliant, but not at the cost of user experience, not at the cost of commercials, you know, so again, it has to be competitive and the best in class, and it has to be Sharia compliant, right? And again, some banks are uh, have achieved that status. Many other banks are still struggling. Now, if we agree that these are the three practical problem statements that we are seeing in the market, what we are seeing is also certain potential solutions that we've got, right? And what we are seeing is right now, there's a proliferation of customer facing apps and apps is a very simplified version of the platform uh, that is at play that is helping people manage their financial lifestyle, right? And in a Sharia conscious manner. So there are three different parts of it. There are customer facing platform that are coming up. They are embedded in the customer's lifestyle. They do not have to stop what they're doing and go walk into a branch and try to do their financial dealings. It's embedded within the lifestyle and it is being done in a Sharia conscious manner, right? So it is all doable. Why Sharia conscious manner is doable? Because now there are enough products and now there is enough governance in place for us to understand how to address this market, right? So that is one. So what we are saying is non-banks are going to enter the space and they're going to take a pie of this, uh, of this business, number one. Number two, the potential solution we are seeing in the market is banks are now graduating and now maturing from focusing on automation, which basically meant KG, my process was A, B, C, D, and E, and I automated it to digitalization, which basically means that, you know what, I understand how my customer is, is spending his time, right? He's spending an, on average about between six and 11 hours on the mobile app, right? He's having, he's uh, looking at uh, on average about 50 apps in a month, right? In different apps. So I understand, and therefore I understand how to embed it within their lifestyle. So banks are also moving to Digitalization, a classic example of that is Russian digital account, for example, where you can open a bank account without ever walking into a, a, a branch. And similarly, the peer-to-peer -peer that we are seeing from SECP and a number of other initiatives that are coming out, right? And a third potential solution for students of Islamic finance is to differentiate between Islamic fintech and fintech for Sharia conscious customers. And how do we differentiate? So Islamic fintech will be Islamic business model, businesses, which are based on Sharia compliant products and follow Sharia compliant governance. Fair enough, right? I mean, very simple definition that has been achieved. I think most of us understand this. However, the FinTech for Sharia conscious customers, what that means is businesses that are appealing, that are relevant to Sharia conscious customers. And there, there is less about Islamic and more about understanding of the business model and how do you actually build that appeal, that scale. So from this perspective today, what I will do is I will talk about, you know, this problem statement and this potential solution. I'll talk about how it has changed the banking business. What are the risk implications? What are the new expertise required? And because it's, FinTech is a huge area, I'm gonna focus on a little bit about open data uh, that is coming into play and which SCCP is also very focused on. Right, and I'm going to talk about also a little bit about blockchain and then talk about, so what does it mean for Islamic finance industry? Just to do a recap, and some of you may have seen this slide previously as well, every aspect of the banking business model is being disrupted. In very simple terms, if you talk about the deposit industry, banking deposits, you know, we are saying that you know the digital wallets like Alipay's of the world and Uber's of the world and Kareem's of the world are actually taking a share of that market from the banks, right? So yesterday, if I had $100, I was keeping $10 in my pocket and 90 with banks. Today, I'm only keeping 60 with banks and five is with Starbucks, 10 is with Kareem, 15 is with Amazon and so forth, right? So the deposit market share is actually shifting from banks to these non-bank apps. Financing, if you talk about it, going at 50% per annum. Of course, there's a small uh, 
base, I'm talking about global stacks, right? It's a small base, so it's growing very fast. But a number of these uh, fintech businesses have come up and have taken their business away. Why? Because their intermediation cost was a lot lesser as a, as a result of using platform um, uh, models, right? When you look at trade finance, trade finance is being reinvented in a massive way. And it's a once in a 50 year opportunity to really position yourself uh, uh, as Islamic financial institution on this trade finance route, right? And what we are saying is the supply chain, the bank payment obligation, the LCs and the LGs of the world are actually moving to the likes of TradeShift, Tolia, uh, Demica, Orbian, a number of these platforms that have been put together by club of different banks and trade finance has shifted as a result of which it has brought down uh, both the compliance risk, the cost of doing business, as well as the speed at which these transactions are being executed. And there again, blockchain is, is very successfully being implemented. And when you look at operations of financial institution, then robotics is something that you may be familiar with. And what we are saying is right now, so for example, at, when we are working with banks in, in Kuwait and Bahrain, what we are saying is by automating some of your processes, your objective you know, beyond the headline should be, how can I bring my cost income ratio from 40 or 50% down to 20 and 30%, right? And it is happening. So when I when we were working with KFH Bahrain, uh, we said, you know what, when you start digitalization uh, and you, when, when you, and they're a smaller bank in Bahrain, right? Their headquarters in, in Kuwait. So we said, start with digital customer acquisition and drive customer adoption in, in, on that front. Extremely important, digital identity, right? And on this one, they did it, right? And once they did it, we said, okay, now introduce other deposit products, now introduce other financing products, now introduce other card products. As a result, today in three years time, I can share with you that their cost of customer acquisition is down by 80%. Now that's disruption, right? If I can demonstrate that your cost of customer acquisition is down by 80%, their average deposit per customer is up. They are getting more deposits from their platform than all their branches combined. And their cross sell is up by three times. Now, when I speak in this business language, there is less to do with Islamic part of it because you know the products was there, the governance was there, but that reach wasn't there, right? That experience wasn't there, right? And it took a lot of change of mindset for KFS to say, to accept, to lower their ego and say, okay, gee, yes, I've been in the business forever, but I do not understand everything about digital identity. I do not understand about everything about platform. And I will not be a technology expert overnight, but if I can relate digitalization to this, uh, you know, increasing my customer market access, then it makes a lot of sense, right? So, and I'll keep talking about some of the examples as well. So what are those exponential technologies that are actually making an impact? Uh, decisive impact, right? And I will talk about eight of them, especially uh, eight plus one. So blockchain, of course, as we know, in 1990s, internet came up and uh, Pakistan lost out, right? Uh, because we became users of internet rather than shapers of internet. What I will say is blockchain is a very similar revolution in technology space, if not bigger. And right now we've got once in a 30 year reset that is happening. So if our students and especially students of Islamic finance, and I count myself in there as well, if we can get a hang of how it is relevant and how to be implemented, then you know you can be the shapers of industry. Cloud, um, and, and, and that's a very nice phrase of saying that, you know, well, it should be centralized uh, data that you should be storing and the cost will be a lot lesser. Uh, and PTCL is coming out with uh, some great data centers at the moment. And, and you know, the regulators are working towards allowing some of the services to be cloud ready and I can confirm in Bahrain for the first time ever, for the first time ever, by the way, the first bank, KFH, was allowed to go on international cloud. Till now, banking data could not leave the shore, right? And doesn't matter if you're banking as long as you need to understand all these terminology, right? So we were able to do AWS in Bahrain as well, but it was young. So we had to use the certain services which are there in Singapore. And there was about 3000 hours that were spent between various teams and the regulator to say that how can the how can the data be shared on the cloud, international cloud then, in a, in a very safe and secure manner to bring the power of analytics and customer experience to, to the market here. So for, for the first time ever, Bahrain has just achieved this in the last quarter. 
right? So the social uh, is the new theme and social payments, you will hear more and more going forward. You need to understand what that means. Security, right? It's not a matter of if you will get hacked, it's just a matter of when you will get hacked. And that digital security, you'll have to, you'll have to take a call on that. So, you know, Bahrain is supposed to be one of the more progressive ones, even in the region here. And when we, when, when they were, they are asked that, you know, have you done your homework? Do you understand fully all the risk? The answer at some point in time, they had to take a call that, you know, regulations is not going to be what it has been for the last hundred years. Right now, we will never have all the answers. We'll have to take some certain calculated risks. And therefore they opened up the market a lot faster in terms of open banking, open data, uh, digital identity than other markets, right? On this one. So a calculated risk, how do you take that? Platform. If you do not understand what it means, you are going to be out of business very soon, right? The entire economy, we call it platform economy. The entire business, be it financial or non-financial, are going to get rewired around platforms. In very simple business terms, what that means is till yesterday, all your business components were controlled by you, were internally sourced, were internal to you. In tomorrow's business, 30% of that will be controlled by you. 70% you will be collaborating with the rest of the market. And you have to be very good in collaboration and banks are not necessarily known for the collaboration skills, right? So the entire economy, entire economy, entire Islamic economy is going to get rewired around platforms in quarter two, I can share with you for the first time ever, you will see an Islamic platform index coming out. Um, we are part of that consortium that are working on it. Uh, and, and to measure that, you know, not just in financial services space, but also in other space, how are these platforms working? What kind of risk et cetera, they expose us to? Banking APIs, uh, most of us are familiar with them. In very simple terms, it is about how do two softwares talk to each other? And right now the boardroom conversation is, well, the legacy systems are not API ready. And even the banks and no bank, I will say has quality APIs. In UK, when they introduced open banking about four years, five years back, it took them two years, three years for banks to become a open banking API ready to upgrade their quality of their APIs to that minimum regulatory threshold that allows data to be exchanged in a secure manner, right? So banking APIs sometimes is used generically. We give too much credit to ourselves. Uh, in fact, this is going to be an evolving area. We don't need to be tech expert, but we need to understand what the minimum requirements are. Uh, intelligent automation and advanced analytics. AI is a used and abused word, right? Artificial intelligence, of course, it starts with business intelligence, machine learning, AI, and so forth. Uh, my point is all of us need to understand the power of data, right? And, and that is behind it, end to end. But you know, if I, four years I've been now in this business of how to get these Islamic banks into a tech first era. And if I have to summarize after a lot of definitions, right? And what does digitalization in very simple terms mean? What I'll share with you is what it means is life as we know it and business has gone mobile first. As a result of which technology platform as well as the workflows and customer journeys that are built on it need to be mobile first. And the difference and the difference between good and bad is huge in very simple terms. And, you know, so again, so the entire life and business have gone mobile first for banks, any particular, any bank, typically a universal bank typically has 300 customer journeys, right? 300 customer journeys. No bank has perfected 300 customer journeys as mobile first. Typically banks identify if they get 10 or 15, a mobile first customer journeys in a phenomenal user experience way, they are a great success story. That's all. And banks were investing in this region about a million, $2 million per customer journey for automating it in, 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 the, in the previous era. And that cost has come down big time. It has become one tenth, one twentieth of the cost right now. Right? So, and in also very simple terms, what has happened in financial services world is there are in the technology space, I'm a non-tech person, in the technology space, there are two major systems that need to work together. One is the system of record where all trans transaction data, et cetera, is stored. It's called core banking system, right? 
And then when you hear this term of digital banking platform, that is about the middle and the front, everything to do with customer facing, the orchestration part, right, et cetera. This entire digital banking platform is actually called the digital banking engagement platform. It is a system of engagement. It is about how Netflix works today when you, you know, switch it off on mobile and open it up on laptop. How does it exactly start? Because it has a save and resume feature built into it. How does Uber Kareem remember your last trip because there's an analytics feature built into it, right? The system, and therefore they route you to a different journey depending on the uh, who you are. So the system of engagement is what the digitalization is all about. So again, I don't expect everyone to remember everything, but I'll share some of the experience. There's going to be a lot of thoughts uh, you know, uh, that I'll throw here. And towards the end, we can take some um, questions as well. I know some of us may have already seen this, but I want you to now, you know, just, just you know, empty your head in terms of what you know about banking and have a look once more at if this is a bank, if this is the future of banking that's coming up, right? It's a two minute video on this. Can you hear? Uh, no, we can't hear the no voice sound, yeah. that's sure. Yeah, I, I believe I believe you cannot hear, that's okay. Uh, have a look at the consumer experience and I think a lot of it, lot of it is self-explanatory. Uh, I'll stop it in between. So and I'll maybe do a voiceover. Now, this is about telling people that I understand how you spent your money in the last 12 months. And today I'll be able to help you better, spend better, save more, right? I'll be able to tell you how much extra you've been able to spend and therefore, you know, help you, um, you save more, spend smarter, uh, spend on the go, save on the go, uh, categorize your transaction. If your utility bills, agar aapke electricity bill was very high in summer in the last three years and less in winter, then now summer is coming. I'll be telling you that, you know, how much you need to save. I can tell you on the go in terms of how much markup or the charge up you are paying, depending on what kind of financing mechanism that you are able to do. You don't have to talk to a relationship manager, et cetera, on this one. And this is not just about great visuals, right? This is also about the analytics and the engagement, the workflow engine that's built behind it, right? As a result of which a lot of principles which are true to Islamic finance, like transparency, like governance, like ethics, like trust is now there, but without a middleman in between. So Apple, I'll just stop here, but Apple has really disrupted, right? Uh, has disrupted how financial services work. And they're not just one, right? Google, you must have heard of them. They're now partnering up with eight banks and we don't even know the name of those banks. We don't even care, right? We, they're introducing financial solutions. And what they're saying is my kitchen is going to be these eight banks in different markets. They will serve me with different products, right? But I will control the customer experience and therefore I will have power in my favor. Some very interesting talks that need to be looked at. I'll talk about eight of this uh, trends which you need to understand and if you understand these then you understand uh, what uh, uh, the, the islamic fintech world will be all about in future if you miss out on any of these then, then then you're lost right so let me talk about each one of them with examples what we are saying is in the previous world uh, there was a cost arbitrage bigger banks used to have uh, a cost advantage and smaller players or startup players therefore could not enter. And today what we are saying is that advantage is being taken away as a result of exponential technology. What does that mean? What that means is if you look at uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, they have introduced a national KYC system. Bahrain has just introduced a national KYC system. Saudi is just getting started with it. And what that means is if I have given my data to one financial institution, then again, through a, a trusted ledger, all financial institution upon request should be able to get that access to one truth. And I should not be doing that uh, KYC again and again. So today, what used to happen? You know, bigger banks like Habib Bank or National Bank will have advantage that, you know, my, I've got a huge branch network and therefore my cost of customer acquisition EKYC is less than smaller banks with like Samba or others uh, or Bank Sami who may have a smaller network. Of, of, of branches, right? And now what you are saying is because I've got a central EKYC, 
and I'm able to open the bank account in uh, on my mobile, I'm taking that advantage away from bigger banks and making a level playing field for everyone. Again, goes back to what Ahmad was saying, how can we increase the reach of Islamic finance, right? How can we help these, some of these smaller banks grow very fast? So just to give you, I do not know about Pakistan, but just to give you some data points on Bahrain, the cost of customer acquisition for banks here, for smaller banks was about $40 per customer. Uh, sorry, it was $100 per customer. And for bigger banks was $40. So between $40 and $100 to acquire one customer. Today, it is down to between $8 and $15 per customer as a result of the national KYC system, right? Massive. And all these new apps which are coming up, they don't need this branch network. They don't need this, all these people. They're able to. So cost advantage that used to be there in favor of bigger banks is now out. Second is the profit pool. How do you derive your profit is also changing. And I'll just give you one example, which is Betterment or Wealthfront. And there are a number of others as well. They are wealth solution. And that's where, you know, the SCCP license entities come into being as well. Till yesterday, what used to happen is if I've got a deposit account, I've got a deposit account, right? I mean, changing it to an investment account takes a lot of effort, manual, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible. Today, with a click of a few buttons, you can actually switch between your deposit account and your uh, profit generating or investment accounts, right? So that permeability has been created. And as a result of which, if you are counting on KG, you know, if once my customer, always my customer, the cost of change is very high. The effort to change is very high. That's been taken away. Uh, experience ownership. What we are saying is product manufacturing and customer relationship will get more and more de-aggregated, de less aggregated, right? And institutions will have to make a choice. Islamic banks, financial, will have to make a choice in terms of, yes, they will do everything, but what will they specialize in? Are they going to specialize in experience, which requires a very different skill set and uh, kind of partners? Or are they going to be great product manufacturers, right? Who will be supplying it to be it Uber or Kareem who wants to offer microfinance, Islamic microfinance, for example, because they've got a huge captain workforce, or they want to be the product manufacturer and the distributors themselves. So that distinction is going to become more and more clear. Uh, the, another example is Google, for example. Another example is a lot of these retail outlets who are saying, you know, I control the customer footfall. Why should I give up this customer relationship to uh, the guys there? And the question that we are discussing right now at AOP level is, and this all relates to platform, right? Is what that means is there are two implications. One is on governance that you know, now because it's platform, so only 30% of this entire business that I'm doing is in my control. 70% is collaboration. And therefore, how do I manage the governance around that? Number one. Number two, it's about customer. You know, who owns, now here's a very, very important area. Who owns a customer relationship? Very important. Versus who owns customer's data? And number three is then who owns right to use customer data? Now, when you get into those level of details, what you will see is these, so Google has a very different model than Dropbox in terms of the data, uh, you know, privileges that they have, right? And Islamic finance soon will be faced with that. And you will see IOP coming out with their standards very soon on platform banking. Um, you know, and I've talked about uh, platforms already and, and what that also means that there will be different types, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna go in, in each detail. There are a lot of different business models, data monetization, now, uh, I'll, I'll dwell more into this particular topic, especially uh, which relates to open data or what we call in simple language open banking. And that is about, you know, how th does this additional data, especially because of COVID, et cetera, can, that I'm generating today can be turned as to an advantage for me. And more importantly, how, right? What will it take as business model to actually take advantage of this open banking side? Bionic workforce, what that means is, when bots and AI will be used alongside uh, me and you to actually make certain decisions, right? And I'll share with you some very interesting stuff, right? I mean, is that, you know, we should not be talking too heavy stuff, talk ground level practicalities. We did some AI stuff on retail banking on a particular product. And what we were able to do is we were able to analyze last 10 year of history of a bank, credit card customers, and based on which we were able to build certain algorithms. And we were able to therefore go back to the bank and tell them that guys, in the next three months, given the trend of the last 10 years, we can say with 80% accuracy, and I'm talking about a real example, 
that in the next six months, these 10,000 customers, you are at the risk of losing. They will become dormant. Now imagine how important this information is for Islamic banks, right? Right, And therefore, in, instead of focusing their call centers on their 100,000 customers, they can prioritize these 10,000 customers and say, hey, what can I do? Is this important to me? And what can I do to retain them better? So we are starting at ground level with banks talking about very specific, and you know, it's going to be just like last 20, 30 years has been evolution of product by, by product uh, for Islamic finance. Right now, from a technology perspective, business model perspective, it will evolve again product by product in terms of how you apply these technologies to improve your business outcomes, right? So as a result of, the, of, of this exercise with one of the banks, we were able to tell them that guys, by the way, Aapne, you know, you are, you're claiming a lot of credit, but you know, you what, 30% of your credit cards have never been activated. Of the remaining 70, you are at the, law, the risk of losing 20 more, 20% 20 more, if you don't do X, Y, and Z. And you know, anytime it's more than seven, actually we don't, I don't know how to build algorithm, right? But I know what results I need so I can drive. So if you have algorithm and, and we partnered up with a Singapore based firm because talent GCC maybe is not that much, right? Uh, so we were able to partner up with a firm in Singapore and uh, in, so, and then build that algorithm. And now we're insourcing that IP uh, and the second product and third product we are doing it in house, right? So that is a kind of skill set that students of Islamic finance need to acquire. A systemically important text. It's no point saying here yeah, AWS, Google, and all these guys are not important to us, right? Uh, trust me, they are going to be eating your lunch, right? Uh, Uber, Kareem, or technology-enabled businesses, right? Mocha Online, a number of others, you know, ed tech, health tech, um, uh, startups that are coming into Pakistan will have a stake in what we used to call Islamic finance, right? A, a space. And therefore, these larger ones, the systemically important techs who've got massive R&D, uh, we've got to see how we partner up with them. You know, banks try to resist initially and uh, like open data, when I'm going to talk about it, it's actually anti-bank. But why have they agreed to it? Because they've resigned to the fact that there is no choice but to bring down this walled garden, bring down the walls and you know, open up. So collaboration with them. Financial regionalization, that's a great opportunity for Pakistan and for the region, right? So uh, we used to have globalization, one size fits all, no longer is the case. China has taken a very different model approach to consumer finance uh, versus what, what Europe has done on open banking what, with, versus what USA has done on payments. So what I'm saying is each market will prioritize and will come up with its own version of how to apply some of these technologies, right? And therefore we have a real opportunity not just to imitate, but to actually in, um, you know, innovate as well. Now, those were the eight uh, you know, key factors that we need to understand the implications on the business model of Islamic finance, uh, financial institutions. Now, I'm going to put it in a graphic format in what will become the business model of banks, right? So here is how we see it in our last four years of experience of working this space. So what we are saying is there is this new thing called the platform, uh, the digital banking platform or the digital banking engagement platform that's coming up. And that will cut to size the role of core banking system or the system of record. That will become about 20, 30%. 70% will be how do I engage with different segments, right? On top of this, very flexible, very forward-looking platform, technology platform, you'll ha still have those traditional financial products. And Islamic finance industry, we already have perfected a number of these products, right? I mean, the variants of deposits, uh, variants of financing products, et cetera, are already there, right? So the change is the digital engagement platform. On top of it, what you have to introduce is a number of new experiences. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is you should be able to open a bank account in five minutes. Now I've opened a Russian digital account as well, uh, but you know, I, mean, I must say that although it's a huge improvement, it's still not there. Today I can open a bank account in international market in five minutes end to end. And we build that system as well. And many others have built that system as well. Russian digital account still took me about two days. And it took me, you know, to print out the, what do you call it? The, 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 the common reporting standard form, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so the customer journey, for a number of reasons, right? For a number of good reasons. So we are, we are still in that journey. What I'm saying is these experiences need to evolve, right? And you need to decide. You cannot be on paper. You may say, yeah, I'm going to play in every space. But you, each one of us, need to decide which space is it that you're going to specialize in. So EKYC and therefore digital customer acquisition, are you going to be the best? 
are you going to embed yourself in the customer's lifestyle right so chaiwo in tiaz or there's another supermarket or whatever it is or hotels or how am i going to embed myself in in the lifestyle of the customer so that whether they're using spotify whether they're doing square whatever they're using i'm embedded in that that's experiences and that leads me to the third uh, level which we call ecosystem and the blue and the green uh, uh, you know uh, depicts that some of those ecosystems you will be in control but more likely than not you will be a participant in that ecosystem and therefore you need to have people who 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 understand the real economy and financial economy very well and able to bridge and become relevant to those ecosystems and again i go back to the principles of islamic finance as the 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 spirit of islamic finance hum legally we are yes sharia compliant today but all of us understand there's a journey where we are trying to become in spirit sharia compliant as well right how do we get to the bull side and one of the key components there key elements there was clear how do we the islamic finance help bridge the real and finance uh, real and financial economy and here is where we see a game emerging which will be a classic which will be a classic game and if you are not able to then you will become an irrelevant part of the islamic finance industry if you are not able to manage these ecosystems as institutions and professionals so let me stop there i know you know i mean i don't expect that all of us will be able to get everything but i hope i've been able to provoke certain thinking before i get into another interesting idea that's being embraced by islamic banks big time which is open data or open banking ahmed is the pace okay am i putting people to sleep or should i continue no no yeah we are, we, we are very much enjoying <laughs> chale zabardast so let me then take about uh, uh, you know 15 minutes or 10 10 to 12 10 to 15 minutes on open data and every one of us have probably heard about this at a high level we are uh, uh, right now in the process of getting a cbb license for as an open banking entity and we are helping the national credit bureau in in, in saudi build their open banking proposition so we've had the opportunity to look at it a little bit deeper and i feel this is one another in addition to platform this is the second uh uh you know disruptive theme that will help us achieve our objective of financial inclusion and uk is the market is the global leader in this um you must look at open banking implementation entity obie if you're not following that on linkedin please do uh we've learned a lot from them and in simple terms why did uk become successful in open banking because the tone was set right and it was regulatory driven right so one is they came up with the regulations on how the in very simple terms this is about how the data will get exchanged between various parties in a controlled systematic manner right in in very simple terms and then the second part is as a result of this exchange of data a lot of new players you're going to break the monopoly of larger banks or a small group of banks and you're going to open up the market for innovation with all these new customer facing apps that are coming up in a control systematic manner you'll allow them to actually serve these customers uh, diff different needs of these customers right but when we looked at certain other markets including in gcc they were not as successful as as uk and why because we believe you know one is the motto was right motto was how do we break the monopoly increase financial inclusion increase competition right so these are not just words that this was the driving objective number one number two once the regulatory framework was in place they actually funded and asked the nine largest banks in uk to actually fund the uh, uh, stand uh, a centralized they set up a centralized implementation entity why because it was not easy and it took them two years three years for all the banks to actually upgrade their apis to become open data ready right to be able to actually share their data in a certain very other markets who left it to individual banks were not able to achieve this it's taking them a lot longer and they're struggling badly including barin right they're struggling right and they're now correcting uh, them themselves so the implementation entity is very important and i'll talk about the objective of the next 10 minutes will be to give you a flavor of what kind of business models are actually working first and foremost let's talk about the why right i mean from a business perspective so the open data or open banking that we're talking about is serving a few objectives and you have to absolutely 200% either believe in it or don't go for it and that is about you know that many of the larger banks have gone complacent we need to open up innovation is coming from different uh, actors 
we need to open up the market and give them a playing field, a level playing field. Just like what Islamic finance was all about, right? It was talking about, give us a level playing field because we are competing with the much bigger boys. Now what we are saying is, you know, there's a huge segment of the market that's coming up other than traditional Islamic or conventional banks, open up the market for them because they customers love them more than banks. And I think, you know, I mean, forget about our vested interest. I really feel this will break this, this, this disconnect between real economy and financial economy, right? The idea was to increase competition. The idea is to increase, increase, increase financial inclusion, right? I mean, you know, it's by bringing down cost to acquire and cost to serve. Trust me, those are two very, very important KPIs and all the boardrooms are driven by them, right? And then greater efficiency in the banking system. So these are the strategic objectives as a result of which markets that have succeeded are the ones where it is driven by regulations. Why? Because the incumbents are absolutely not open to give up their monopoly till the regulators ask them to. And in fact, in UK, the uh, government asked, the regulator asked the nine largest banks to actually fund this implementation entity so they can come up with the minimum API standards, et cetera, you know, so that will allow the data exchange to happen. And there are some very uh, pertinent questions that are being asked, right? I mean, in terms of, so, you know, which means now I'm talking, going to talk about from a practical industry perspective. So banks are saying, okay, so open banking is coming. It's all nice words, but tell me how it is going to be done. And, you know, you, do you understand the challenges I face? And what they are saying is as banks, help me understand how do I access this data from other banks? Will it be masked? Will it be customer names? How exactly is it going to happen? You know, now, then they're asking, okay, once I've acquired that data, what do I do with it? Right? And what do I do with it? How do I provide, you know, some valuable insights to customers? And I will not be a perfect in everything. I have to choose my playing field. And then I have to be very good. But how do I provide that? And then, you know what, Mr. Regulator, you know, you're asking me to open up my business. But the minute I open my business, you know, all the most profitable areas are going to get picked up. Payments is going to go away, right? Deposits is going to go away. I mean, am I mad? Why should I be doing this? So on one hand, as Islamic finance practitioners, we're talking about inclusion. But on the other hand, we are very protective of, 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 of our business, right? So these are the questions. And, and it's very interesting how open banking has become from anti-bank to actually bank friendly. I'll talk about that as well. Then there were new entrants, a separate set of stakeholders, new entrants, financial services, right? The likes of Kareem, Uber, Mocha, EdTech, Health Tech, that kind of stuff. And what they're saying is, you know, we are very small. We can't afford to spend all this money. Help us make this KYC and anti-money laundering using open data a lot easier and a lot more uh, cost-friendly, right? Uh, how do I get access to the transactional data that, my, uh, that, that the clients have, right? I mean, help me understand that. Uh, how do I, uh, you know, this payments, right? I mean, now uh, Bilal Saab, for example, or Ahmed, you know, for example, today, if I were to tell you, let's make MasterCard and Visa redundant, what is your reaction going to be? And but I can I can I like take the liberty idea. to pick on you. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. You know, it's coming, right? It's coming as a result of open data. And I'll talk about how bank to bank transfer. So I was in, uh, in Riyadh last week and I was talking to a local group, which is one of the larger groups, and they said I've got 100 million plus uh, footfall. And I said, and, and you know, X million transactions in a year. And I said, how much are you paying to MasterCard Visa? They said 2.7%. I'm like, what if I am able to save that for you? And that goes directly to your bottom line. They asked, when can I start? Right? right. So they want double compliant. Islamic products and governance are in place. But now we're talking about how do I increase this reach of my business and go back to what I've been saying, the spirit of Islamic finance, how do I break this, uh, this disconnect between real and financial economy? Right? And it's happening. The model is in place now. And Visa and MasterCard are not sleeping. They understand this. They're already addressing this and they're reinventing themselves as well. All right. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, aggregators that are coming up. All right. Um, they're set, and, and then there's a regulator coming uh, who's asking guys, you know, easier said than done. How do I set up the open data infrastructure? And some markets have done it a lot better than others. So once we ask these questions, you know, asking the right question is very important to set the answer right, to get the answer right. Once we ask this question, then to simplify it, and this is our last 10 months of, uh, you know, trying to understand all these terminology and so forth, open banking product, product portfolio, and the right word should be open access or open data, 
is about four key clusters of solution that you will provide. One is that you will come up with a gateway that provides access to customers' account information, payments account information to be specific, right? So all the data, so if I have five different banks that I'm banking with, then as an open bank customer, I should be able to see it on one app, all my accounts across these five banks in a nicely categorized, sensible manner. The entire engagement between customers and banks is changing as well. The time, the era of those boring customer, you know, bank statement is over. So, you know, that, that, you know, in a lot of these margins is changing very quick, right? So categorization in a very sensible way across banks, not just in your local market, but also in the region slowly and others as well, just as integration is happening. So account information gateway is a, a, a very powerful product portfolio. You need to get familiar with this. Islamic banks also need to get familiar with payment initiation. And what that means is take the middleman out, Visa and MasterCard out and do a bank to bank transfer. Wallets are sometimes storing and sometimes not storing, but they're already trying to do that, right? And now this is happening at a much bigger level and what you know, and, and I'll show in, in, in a visual as well. And then there are premium services. Now this is, should be very relevant to Islamic finance students. And what these services mean, there are a lot of examples of that. What that means is today, when I'm giving financing to a certain person, I'm saying, yeah, how much salary do you get? And therefore you are worth this much of financing. But today, if I've got his payment transaction data of the entire five, last two years or three years, right? Imagine what, if I can make sense out of that data, I can understand here, yeah, you know what, he's spending so much on holidays. Uh, he's sending so much on um, his, uh, his, his wife's uh, jewelry. He's so, so much on cars, et cetera, et cetera, right? Especially in country like ours, where, you know, the undocumented economy is big. Now this kind of data, and if FBR is able to really, you know, put that project in, in, in action, in terms of, you know, how, at point of sale, et cetera, uh, you know, monitoring the transit, imagine the kind of, credit files that you can build. And we call it light credit files, which means you don't have to do extensive due diligence, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, you know, small credit, you know, a lot of people are credit worthy, but salary is not an indication of that, right? And now you've got alternative data away with this. So there are a number of use cases, one of them being credit files as well. Right? Number one. And the fourth one for new jurisdiction that's just getting started with, with open banking is the infrastructure solution. Now I'll talk about what that means. And the way that, you know, again, going back to the questions we asked ourselves, right? That for banks, the challenge is these three that we identified, how is it solved? Each one of them is solved either by account information gateway or payment initiation gateway or certain premium services, right? That you can uh, uh, resolve uh, at this question. What does the business model look like on a page? Uh, very simply put, um, what I'll say is this is the banking architecture. So this is the legacy banking infrastructure at the bottom. What you need to do is, you know, again, the data is a massive nightmare right now. No one is able to solve it, not even in the best of market. But what you are saying is, can I come up with two sets of APIs? And this will be relevant to SCP and SVP. One is the minimum threshold, which is the regulatory APIs, i.e. I need to, Mr. Bank or Miss Bank, you need to open up your data in a certain structured manner to the market participant, which are licensed by SCP. Right, and they must meet this uh, this, this this quality threshold. So especially on eKYC, especially on compliance aspect, etc. So there are a set of APIs uh, that are uh, developed from a regulatory perspective, and then on top of it, there is other value added APIs. For example, here, uh, can I get how much? How has he paid his mortgage payments over the last ten years, or how has he paid his car financing payments over the last five years? Right. Those are the value added information, which may not be the regulator may choose not to define or not make it mandatory. And they leave it to the bank to share or not share. But once banks see the advantage of sharing this data in a consented manner, you know, this mess, it, it, it's really helpful. Bottom line is open banking is about breaking the information silo and giving back control of consumer data back to consumers and saying, hey, yeah, you have the authority to give permission on who will see your data and not see your data. So just because you're working with one bank A or bank B or bank C does not mean they control and they keep the data, your data with them. You are now enabled to share your data in a structured manner with a number of these apps that are coming up, platform that are coming up. And some of them may be able to, so in UK, there are now 263, there are 263 
third party users that we call it third party providers which means new players who have who have specialized in different smaller areas here sme ki accounting services how am i going to help improve that uh you know personal financial management the spending pattern how am i going to look at that right the round up of savings and therefore helping micro savings how am i going to do so there are 263 that have already been licensed and i see a classic uh relevance for sep there and there are 400 plus more which are in the pipeline that is why i mean and what i'm saying is now imagine if against 20 or 30 or 50 banks there are another 600 of these uh, solution providers who are specializing in small verticals whether we call it banks or not uh, you know there will be a new definition of banks come up imagine the kind of the when we talk about inclusion you know when we talk about it not imagine the kind of innovation you will unleash and that is also the objective of the special technology zone authority that has been set up by the government recently to help attract this kind of talent and bring this kind of innovation up right on this one so here when we talk about the business model itself two sets of apis and what we mean by that is a software which is called open banking compliance solution all the regulator need to do is make sure that yeah, yes uh, this solution is there it's already working in many other markets uh, there is no reason why pakistan cannot implement it very quickly and, and be a fast follower on that one it connects to the core this software or this platform connects to the core banking system of banks and it comes up with you know regulatory which is basic as well as uh, you know consented a strong customer authentication authorization the digital identity is the fundamental one right so these are the one set of apis and then value added apis the grammar so start with minimum right i mean and, and allow this thing first on the other hand in parallel what these open banking companies like ours will do then there is sortage token i a number of others in the market but you know in the region here is us there are about others right you know what they do is ke acha ji matlab you know when i get all this information from a bank in a controlled systematic manner this is the gateway through which account information services i will collate aggregate clean up and provide right and this is how i'm going to help on the payment side and this pos uh, you know and this terminal thing on the on the micro payment side by state bank is great as well as scp is doing wonderful with this peep to peep and other businesses coming up right so all this stuff we call it the gateway right a gateway rather than having 50 everyone having a pipe trying to connect with every bank there are four or five or 10 of these companies who build these gateways and who connect with banks and as a result they are able to do data aggregation and mixing with alternate data to come up with certain use cases for end customers right acha in the international market all these three conceptually can be the same company but typically this dark blue shaded is done by one set of businesses and this light blue shade is then a separate set of business simply because the kind of focus etc required and also it's not very capital intensive to launch right so you can really have these youngsters you know i mean again uh to come up with these ideas uh, replicate what's going well in other markets in emerging markets and bring it to pakistan as well in very simple terms this is the business model uh if i want to go a little bit visual into account information service what does that mean by the way what that means is these are a type of information that you can choose to allow or not allow so bilal sir in uk for example they have allowed account information sharing only of deposit account jahan se payments ho rahi hai right uh people are making payments however australia that has been a lot more successful has also allowed sharing information on for example mortgages loans credit cards and everything and bahrain a year back started by replicating uk and saying okay only account information but then they said why and we are only going slow because we are learning right so now the second set of regulation update that is coming in this year first of this year you will see will allow a number of other type of banking data to be shared as well in a controlled manner right now going back the way it happens is right now dekhiye agar main if i am with hbl you know i look at hbl account then i look at ubl then i look at bank islam then i look at mizan then i look at albaraka right etc now what we are saying is because of account information services provided in between right who have x who have aggregated the data if we go back who have aggregated the data but through these regulatory and uh, uh, apis are able to aggregate everything here 
and the customer just because they have access to this app is able to see all their uh, bank information as well as other whatever kind of information they need using this app now the advantage for islamic banks like mizan or like uh, bank islami or like dubai islam whatever it is they can be the first movers and they themselves can become aisp as well so uk allowed licensing to these banks to become aisp as well so kya hota hai okay because what data says is uh, customers are likely to make their primary bank the aisp as well right the aggregator as well right as opposed to the secondary bank however if these banks are late to move what will happen is there are other uh, regulators not going to stop others coming up as well and there could be independent yeah, like yolt is there but is there right uh, saltage is there they are there and they have taken huge market share and right now we uh, you know when we talk of international banks like hsbc like sand chart i was talking them in uk they are paying 1 million dollars per year subscription fee as well as per user fee to these aisps right and by the way they are getting a lot of good roi on that because the kind of information they are able to get they are able to put it to use and the islamic banks are no different right so what you are saying is you are making life for customers very easy uh, through this aisp um this is another depiction of how it works that all these different banks are there by the way we call our new entity that we are applying for license uh, from cbb aspire right so what's going to happen and this is actually from our strategy document so what these different banks are going to do is they are going to link there we a major pipe here and we are going to link with all these different apis of different banks which are of different qualities and going to save hassle for all these new entrants to uh the financial services industry to not being able to do each individual integration with each one of them right so they will integrate with us we will integrate will will uh, integrate with all the banks on the other side and we will be the aisp right uh, on, on this one so this is just one example but this is how it works on the payment side i know i'm taking a lot of time on the payment side i've already summarized that it is about taking the middleman and the acquirer out in simple term this is what it means when the payment initiation services provider is there then what it means is the issuer bank and the merchant will be able to do direct transactions without the acquirer and the card network and this is already happening and businesses are becoming financial institutions in in, in this manner right and there's no reason why why pakistan in pakistan also we cannot bring this uh, cost and complexity down right uh, and and really and therefore make digital you know or or uh, uh app based transactions or payments a lot uh, bigger and more and this is how things happen right i mean you know you're on an e-commerce website for example uh you you decide which what what do you want to buy uh and then you, with a click of a button all these banks are integrated in this app if you think about it with this asp right so they ask you okay which bank you are with if that bank is not there of course you cannot do but if the bank is there you can choose that bank you give consent this is where again regulator has a very important role to play a very strong authentication consent management system should be in place and with a click of button and selfies and digital identity you are able to conclude the transaction without visa mastercard and the and the beauty is the cost of setting up this infrastructure has also come down massively so this is just simply an intro that i would want to give a heads up uh, you know that you know open banking is going to be a game changer uh, for islamic financial institutions for all financial institutions including islamic right let me take a 30 second pause here uh, how do you feel uh, lal saab ahmed any any feedback on how pakistan is looking at this uh well i'm very excited ashara i mean uh, you've really uh, cleared my mind uh, there are a lot of uh things that i didn't understand are much much clear i'm very excited actually and it uh, you know i think uh, this is uh, not a game changer i think this is a watershed in financial history i'm not even going to say islamic finance i'm just saying it's uh, definitely uh, the the change is scary but uh, i think the opportunity is uh, you know is very very large as well so a uh, excellent uh, asher for uh, uh, you know just uh, clearing the concepts and everything excellent presentation ahmed uh, yeah i should i think what i like to also mention uh, that uh, there are uh, we are still quite uh, you know behind in this in pakistan but i have seen certain 
segments where we are now i think moving in this direction for example i just share that uh, probably in the next month you will or maybe in the next two months you will hear uh, this something called asan mobile account which is uh, probably a 30 second account opening process mm -hmm. coming up so mm -hmm. maybe we are and similarly uh, these uh, p2p payments uh, using these wallets because uh, state bank of pakistan has allowed electronic money institutions so now these companies are now integrating with the banks uh, through this open network and sec and third thing probably we uh, from for bankers we need to we need uh, more use cases to understand this because yeah. as as you mentioned that a non technical person will say will be lost in these <laughs> jargons but sure. if we know that Uh, Mr. Ashar is talking about uh, how I can double my car's finance, how I can reduce my cost by fifty percent, yeah. how I can get ten thousand customers in twenty uh, days without opening branches. You know, mm -hmm. probably uh, yeah. that will excite uh, our 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 uh, side of the people or our bankers to become more open. Yeah. But uh, the good news is. we have seen this discussion we have uh, maybe we are not technologically so so ahead but now banks are talking about it and the other it's opportunity great, yeah. i see is that uh, this you can uh, because this mobile technology or this technology is uh, is uh, you know easier to adopt mm. uh, in, so you don't need a large scale manufacturing setup in pakistan to become mm. you know the next mm. uh, so you need some smart people some smart companies and some you know uh, uh, probably strategic vision yeah. uh, to uh, to you know to leave to leave forward uh, by using right. these type of things so this See, is Amit, thank point. you very much bilal sir thank you very much you know and and but i would want to highlight as again uh, someone very passionate about islamic finance right like yourself i would like to highlight that we are at the risk of missing out on this opportunity for two reasons right and i just cannot emphasize that this may take 30 seconds like i just cannot emphasize that the cost of this can be next 10 years 15 years playing catching up those two reasons are as students of islamic finance a big majority of us is still stuck on okay yaar if i am passionate about islamic finance what it means is i should understand sharia very well and you know i mean again the products very well and governance very well right i feel that is important but 80% of that has been addressed already by the previous generation over the last 20 30 40 years right if you are passionate about it then we need to be you know you know you know using hikmat we need to we need to understand ke bhai matlab we need to be able to speak this language and if you are not able to relate to this language then as industry leaders we will be left behind and we are doing a disservice to the next 10 years 20 years of islamic finance and i feel sharia scholars uh, product managers risk uh, professionals consultants bankers we are not giving enough attention here uh, to to understand what this is you know, to, to to understand the kind of massive this this dramatic change that is coming our way right so as leaders i believe that we need to emphasize this and soon we need to emphasize it from number one number two the big risk the huge risk is the leadership and i can openly now say leadership of banks right of of big institutions are not cut out most of them are not cut out to lead this change like some of them who are smart and not everyone will be right? i mean this is a this is a standard law right that like 20% honge jo ahead of the curve honge 80% will be followers but that 20% need to be very vocal ke yaar yes we been a thinking about technology in a certain way for last 20 30 years i will never be able to relate to it but i need to trust the likes of amman likes of others etc to say yaar run with it build this ecosystem right work with them we'll open up the bank in a controlled manner that we are not seeing enough uh in the region here i will say there are a few banks who been very you know call it the hedge funds of the islamic finance or the risk takers or the risk seekers but most of them are absolutely sleeping right they're still going with a very traditional mindset ke ji core banking is very legacy how do i write off this much amount blah 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 they they they're doing a disservice i would say so i'll be very strong critical here that you know we are at the risk of losing this once in a 10 year opportunity if number one as islamic finance practitioners we don't uh, familiarize ourselves with this uh, uh, language 
right? This new language that is emerging, the business models. Number two, the leadership at these big institutions need to become a lot more open and quickly. Otherwise, a 60-year-old trying to address the needs of a 25-year-old or in 10 years' time who will become a third grade is simply not we are we not seeing. Sorry, I'm on a tangent here. So no, uh, thank you, uh, Asher. For uh, you know earlier I said I was scared. Now I'm terrified because you very aptly uh, pointed out the the two uh, uh, reasons why this uh, may not be successful. But I think you know. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, concede and I'm going to take on the responsibility as the regulator. I think the regulatory regime would also be responsible for the success or failure. And, uh, and you sh if you ask why I'm terrified is that, uh, you know, uh, everyone's talking about the supply side and, all, and, and, you know, the demand side and everything, but there is a regulator who needs to sit down and you know, sort of uh, lay down the tracks right. on which, right. uh, you know, the, the, the train is going to run. And, right. uh, you know, if the train is just running out there without any tracks, it's going to road roll a lot of stuff. So, you know, I think um, my next webinar should be on reg tech and we need to get, uh, you know, 100%. going on that. So, well, you know, it, 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 it's the, uh, you know, I always speak analogically that, you know, it's the Quran and the ayahs first, and then, you know, the subsidiary, Jovi, uh, you know, Ahkam, and the other uh, principles. Hai. But uh, we need to, you know, uh, subscribe and, you know, practice what is uh, the primary, uh, jo, uh, uh, jo principles or wo, uh, regulations where are. So regulation, I think, is very important. You've got me, you know, uh, okay, you've woken me up. Uh, so I think uh, a, a big area that needs to be looked at. Mm. And where I would appreciate uh, any, you know, suggestions. And if you've done any work, if you've seen. Uh, I'm happy uh, to uh, connect. Happy to connect yeah. with yourselves right now. As I said, you know, we are connecting with the Central Bank of Bahrain, with Central Bank of Saudi. Uh, and, and everyone is learning right now. And honestly, even we are not experts, right? Hamdavi Jatija think tanks create TN by connecting with the UK market, et cetera, bringing them on the, such webinars like this and, and learning from them as well. So I, I guess once the mindset changes, everything else follows. Honestly, the only thing is about mindset. And we are very quick to blame banks and leadership, et cetera. Even myself, right? I mean, me and all the, you know, 78 participants on here, We've got to ask ourselves okay, how much we are doing, right? I mean, charity starts from home. So, it, 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 so, okay, so in the interest of time, if I can just take maybe two minutes, I don't have a lot of time on blockchain. I'm not going to get into details of blockchain. That can be a huge subject by itself. All I will say is uh, once you understand blockchain, right? And I've tried to simplify it. Once you, then the Islamic angle to it is around smart contracts, right? Of course, there's a business reason, et cetera, to it as well. But it's about smart contracts and, and then it's about the governance around it as well. Uh, very similar to what is relevant to any platform, right? And thinking on that has, uh, is in very initial stages, right? So, but this is a huge revolution. We need to stay connected with it. I don't think so it's coming uh, in the next one year or two years, but it's definitely coming and coming in a massive way. Uh, yes, digital currencies, as well as uh, uh, the likes of Bitcoin and Ethereum, we are hearing, you know, are, are, are doing quite well and they're all are driven by this blockchain concept. So we need to have a better understanding of that. From an Islamic angle, it's more about, you know, again, the principles of speculations, uh, 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 principles of, uh, uh, you know, smart contracts, you know, how the contracts are written, are the Sharia compliant or not, how the governance is. But otherwise, from a business moral perspective, this is what it is, right? I mean, it helps bring down the cost it helps, uh, you know, take care of the information asymmetry. Uh, you know, it gives a lot more autonomy to the participants. Trade finance is a massive area that absolutely will get reinvented as a result, as well as global payments, right? Uh, so a number of use cases, and I think we need to focus as non-tech people on the use cases and the business model rather than uh, the technology, because that itself is a, is, is a massive area. In the interest of time, what I will say is, and I'm not going to get into all these details, you know, I, I mentioned this last time as well. These are the new face of uh, risk, right? The eight uh, most important risks, which we do not understand or which we've not been trained. 
as bankers and regulators in today's world to take care of it, right? Uh, we have collaboration, right? Ecosystem management when I'm not controlling everything. Data flows, sharing and usage where different parts of business are moving at different uh, space. Growth of utilities, which means national KYC. What is a liability model going to look like, right? And if something does go wrong, is the bank responsible or this national KYC? So who's responsible to where? A lot of conversations happening, right? On these ones. But what I want to touch base upon is again, some business questions I will leave with you is but that given the Islamic finance industry, Bilal Sahib, as you said, is relatively smaller and uh, we are grounded in being purpose-led, has a lot to gain from FinTech-based business models. And what that means is the change that is happening is the scale, economies of scale around assets. Now we are talking about data, all right? I tell you, if Pakistan can specialize in this area, uh, we are going to catch up on the last 20 years lost, right? I mean, that, that we have. Similarly, we are talking about hyper-personalization. And I was just thinking about from an Islamic angle, you know, we, talk, we, we think we are champions in personalization. Imagine Allah Ta'ala who's looking at this galaxy and everyone and still giving hyper-personalized attention to us. Can we bring even a, a you know, a, a, a symptom of that to, to financial services as well? Uh, with some of these technologies, now we can. Right, exclusivity of relationship, very important. They're not just nice words. Banks used to pride themselves, Ki ja, mere paas ek customer aage is not going to leave me for next 10 years. And that's what used to happen, right? Now what we are saying is there's a lot more uh, that is happening, uh, you know, with, with all these new entrants, et cetera, coming in. Uh, switching costs and therefore mobility has become a lot easier and uh, technology. So again, as is passionate, uh, as given that we are passionate about Islamic finance, we need to look beyond just the Sharia aspect and talk about the business model aspect and see how business can be made share compliant and scalable. And if I want to end by again, aligning it to the spirit of Islamic finance, we talk about being purpose led, right? The questions there, the discussion and the trade-offs there need to talk about, should we start with peer to peer lending uh, or peer to peer financing, or should we peer to business to start with? So for example, also from a, um, you know, fiduciary responsibility perspective as well. Do you want to promote consumption debt, right? Very important point. Or do you want to direct resources towards more about more productive sector and therefore appear to business kind of platforms or licenses, right? Or something that is now right now very famous in the world by now, pay later, uh, call it by now, regret later as well, right? Uh, is, is that something, how aligned is it to the Islamic finance principle again of consumption driven uh, economy, right? Uh, to build an inclusive system, you talked about reg tech. Within reg tech, digital identity and open data will be absolutely critical. Uh, we talked about a number of times bridging financial and real economy. I believe that you know with artificial intelligence and the level of personalization we are seeing that is now has, has come into being. And financial well-being, right? Prince Charles actually in one of the conferences said, and it has stuck in my mind when he came to Bahrain, he said, you know, you talk about Islamic principle is about risk sharing. I want to put on the table, how's that risk sharing happening between this generation and next generation, right? How are you being responsible towards your next generation? So here also in a very smaller way, what we are saying is in the financial well-being is, it's not just about point of sale, point where if bank is entering, can the bank actually enter the customer's life into the point of intent because of technology is possible, right? I mean, a 25 year old wanting to buy a car or a mortgage in five years time, eight years time, no one is excited about a mortgage. People are excited about a house buying journey. That journey could be five years pre-buying and 10 years, 15 years post-buying, right? So can we actually move the focus using this technology to point of intent instead of being point of sale? And as a result of which, can we bring that customer experience, that feedback loop, we give voice to the customer, get feedback, yeah, you know what? Uh, my money I'm putting in bank A and they're only putting in treasury. Is that good? Well, it is serving a certain purpose. You know, it is helping the public sector when the government needs it most uh, versus another one, which is actually have a big portfolio in SME portfolio and that is creating employment, right? So it is that kind of relevance we have to bring to the mind of the customer. With technology, it is possible. And then tomorrow I can vote with my money and then, you know what, Bank Islami is doing a lot more entrepreneurial stuff, but my uh, thinking is more towards, I don't know, affordable housing. And Mizan is doing a lot more affordable housing uh, portfolio and is, is growing. So can I somehow, you know, 
tell them with voting with my money that you know I like this and this is what I'm thinking. My return on my deposit is not going to go up, but at least I can help direct the movement of money in the economy. I guess what I will end up with is we have an opportunity as Islamic finance leaders to actually shape the thinking process of the next ten years, fifteen years to come, and not be hostage to what we've been doing in the last twenty years. That's it, sir. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you, Thank you on behalf of um, uh, SECP and IBA. Uh, uh, guess what? Um, you will be in uh, the next few webinars with us. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah, my pleasure, sir. Inshallah, I, I am uh, offering the participants if there are any suggestions for webinars. Uh, you know, if there's something that needs to be. Uh, looked into more detail, something you don't understand. We are open to suggestions and we can have experts like Ashok join us, Ahmed as well. So we have a lot of talent, uh, you know, uh, just tell us and we can arrange the webinar. Ahmed, thank you very much for once again uh, uh, coordinating and um, arranging this webinar. Ashar, uh, from my side, I look forward to meeting you more Inshallah, uh, sir. Future. And uh, if, if do you want to take any questions, I think the time is up. So um, the time is up. I believe uh, if I can uh, request Ahmad and Zia, you know, I mean, the presentation I'll make available. I've just gone through these questions. Yeah, I you think know, there have uh, been some re requests for the uh, copy of the presentation, if you can send that on. Yes. So Ahmed, uh, no. Jazakallah. So uh, thank you, uh, Asher, for a wonderful session. And uh, as mentioned by Bilal Saab, a uh, lot of new things, wake up calls, uh, some, uh, you know, some more learning about how to move ourselves, how to move Islamic finance forward. And I think we will be, we need to all actually focus more on these emerging trends, need to understand and how to, you know, apply them in, in, uh, in Pakistan in our, or in our different uh, Islamic financial institutions. Uh, so, and uh, we will share the presentation uh, uh, by Mr. Asher Nazim uh, on the Facebook of IBSC. We will share the link there so uh, people can download the slides uh, and they can use. The video recording is also available on IBSC Facebook. And uh, uh, so, inshallah, we will share. Uh, you can also listen back once uh, to, uh, to this uh, session again if you need to, uh, or you need, can refer to other people as well. So, with these, uh, uh, there are a couple of questions, but uh, because of the shortage of time, uh, we will we have to conclude the day for the session for today. So, I like to thank uh, Ashan Nazim once again uh, on behalf of IBSC, and uh, I like to thank uh, Mr. Bilal Rasul Saab for. Uh, you know, working with us, with IBSC and, uh, you know, uh, highlighting, uh, uh, bringing these uh, latest topics uh, for our audience. So uh, Bilal Saab, thank you. Asher Saab, thank you. Exactly. And I also like to thank all the participants who have joined us today. Uh, I am very happy to see participants from UK, from Malaysia, from uh, Bahrain, from uh, Bangladesh, from, I think, Sri Lanka. And so this was a global uh, this is, I think, the global reach as well. So people were interested uh, from different parts of the world for this session. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, inshallah, we will be bringing up more uh, of these sessions uh, in the days to come. And thank you once again. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.